public meeting of the Willett City Council order for August 26th. Can we all rise and join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, we got through that. Let's try the roll. Yes. Strong? Yes. Hornstein? Here. Here. So, last, last meeting I got off track to start with and never quite got back on, so I'm going to try and pay a little more attention to my city manager tonight. Uh, we need to add one item to the to the agenda correct that's correct uh, can we do that how can we get a four-fifths vote with well we can conceivably we can, we can. Four. Four. yeah four. everybody step and fetch it here <laughs> uh, so we have an uh, item 14b in closed session as a conference with legal counsel uh, pursuant to code 54 956.5 9 B anticipated litigation exposure to litigation. We always hate to see these things come on the agenda. It's two cases actually. Okay. I'm only seeing it's under one item. It's it's uh, anticipated litigation two items. Okay. Well, it's only. I think normally, and I guess we didn't catch this, you would disclose whether it's one case or two cases, and I guess that didn't, okay. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get a four-fifths vote to add that to the agenda. I'll move to... Uh, Second it. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Councilmember Yes. Strong? Yes. 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 So, uh, public communications. Do we have any public communications this evening? Items that are not on the agenda, no action will be taken. And, uh, and please limit your comments to two minutes. 30, 13 seconds for you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to thank Rod's division and Jeremy. We got a job really well done on Humboldt Street. Uh, they, the do you live in the neighborhood of Humboldt Street, sir? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, it's, my wife does too. But anyway, it was a great job. They hired uh, local contractors on some of their work. Dave Slater did the concrete work and Bud Garman was there with his truck. But it was really nice to have that happen and the job really went well for us. Appreciate the contractors and you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Jeremy, particularly. Okay. Every day. Good. We are pretty proud of that project. Yeah. Any other public communications? You know, I'd like to host public communications, and 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 we had a an, a a lost a really great guy in town last week, uh, high school ag teacher for thirty some odd years, and. <clears throat> and a really, really good friend of mine. So, Greg Randrup, if you uh, if you've been around Willits High, he's kind of Larry's right hand guy. Larry was his mentor, and they shared a common wall and adjoining classrooms forever. But uh, I'd like to just take about a minute or so to. I would like to, to say that the community. And I'm my feeling that lost a, a very nice gentleman. I never heard anything negative about him. And the kids loved him. I mean, it was just, uh, they just were really, I've had people come in the store today still and uh, are still just can't believe it. Anyhow, I agree, Bruce, we lost a really nice man. We did. So Thank you. just give us a, a little bit to remember Greg.
Thank you. And there will be, as I read in the paper this evening, there will be a memorial service for him at the uh, rodeo grounds Saturday at 5 o'clock. So, okay. Uh, <coughs> our next uh, item on the agenda, I believe, is uh, a presentation by Mark Ferguson uh, here from representing the, our insurance group. And, uh, it's Self-insured pool. Pool, exactly. So you're not an insurance salesman. Come on up and, and uh, tell us what's what's in store. Um, what? How are we going to do that? Well, oh, you want to hand me the you mouse? Need, you're going to use the the. Yeah, that's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I will move out of the way, and uh, you can sit at that chair right. Well, you probably need the uh, microphone. I'm fine. I think better standing, actually. Okay. So, my name is Mark Ferguson. I'm the general manager of, of REMIF. REMIF uh, is a program that you're involved in, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit who we are, what we do, and uh, how we're doing it. So, maybe we'll do this and maybe we won't. Okay. I am not IT. I never said I was IT. <laughs> try it now. If you want me just to sit there and punch it. Try, try it now. Mark the ball on it. Just roll it on the mouse. The middle ball. Mm -hmm. oh, how'd you do that? <laughs> Down. Oh, okay. We'll try this. <laughs> Will anyone do this for me? Because otherwise we'll play round the ball all night long. Yeah, this is Elena Pizza. See, she's my workers' compensation claims manager. Uh, I've been with the organization. And just roll it down for uh, a little over 14 years. Elena's been there longer than I have. I'll just go to the next slide. Um, okay, we were established in 1976. We have 15 city members. They're all cities from five counties. Uh, we're self-insured. Um, you're going to hear me say that about six times in this presentation. Uh, we're not insured. Uh, we buy insurance over the top of what we do, but we are a pool. The purpose of a pool is we collect money from 15 members to pay claims. In the world of claims, you generally have six good years and one mediocre year and three bad years. And if you can share that with 15 members, you're generally doing fine. So that, that's why you're in a pool. We cover liability, uh, general auto, workers comp, health care, and we have other programs we talk about a little bit. Who, who are we? Well, we've, we go from Arcata all the way down to the city of Sonoma. Uh, we started with the original members. Uh, now uh, we're up to 15. And everybody, what we have done recently, which Adrian has helped us on, uh, we have now, uh, every member on this group has a voting member on our board. It used to be only uh, nine. We have expanded it with the approval of all our cities. Every member, every member has equal rights to it. Our office is actually in the city of Sonoma. We have 10 people total in our office. So you've got... 20% of our office are here. <laughs> Next. Uh, we're, we're part of a bigger pool, and there's a reason for that, is that uh, we have a certain amount of assets we can put aside. Um, we join a bigger pool, which is 122 cities, primarily in Northern California. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One is 122 cities do the insurance claims the same way. We handle permits the same way. We handle construction, contracts, all pretty much the same way. So, and we feel we do it with, with attorney's background, we do it the right way. So when you're, somebody comes to your city and says, you do it differently in Willits, because no one else does that, my comment is, 122 cities in this region do it the same way. Tell me how we're doing it different. And that comment tends to go away. 
That's why we're part of a bigger pool, so we can all do the things the same way. This is why we're self-insured. Uh, this came out in March of 1986, Time Magazine, uh, America, your insurance is canceled. Uh, and I will tell you, in public service, uh, workers' comp, we could pull back in the 70s, but liability was insured up through the early 80s, and all the insurance companies we were working with walked away from us. Cities were bad risks. You had, oh, police, oh, fire, oh, public works. They do things that hurt, damage, or destroy things. We're walking away. You're too expensive. This is why we're self-insured. One of our programs, the most recent one we got in place, and which I'm kind of really proud of right now, we've gone self-insured for our health care. And I don't know how much the council knows about this, but I'll give you a quick history. Our broker came to us two years ago and said, there's major changes in the health market. You better be in front of the wave and not behind it. Um, we were insuring through uh, Anthem Blue Cross, and of our total number of people in our program, we were paying, last, last year we paid $17.6 million in healthcare costs for our 15 cities. We went to them and said, what will you charge us this coming year? And their comment was, we'll cut you a break will only raise it 9%, hmm. okay? Uh, we saw this coming, talking with our brokers, we looked into self-insurance, we had actuarials done, we put a program together literally in a year. Um, and people are saying, well, why did you do that? Well, if you're insured, you really don't know, for healthcare, you really don't know where your dollars are going. They won't tell you. Your, your insurance companies will not tell you how your dollars are being spent. But we did some research and found that our cost for claims payment for medical was a, around 11 million a year. And, and they had some auxiliaries in there, so it's probably up to about 12 million a year we had in claims. They were gonna charge us this coming year $18.4 million. It doesn't take long to figure out that they're making a 35% overhead uh, profit on you, on all of us. So we went to the board, the board said, make it work. We put our program together, started July 1. Uh, our estimated cost for the first month, yes, it's really early. We believe that our total claims costs, including overhead, and excess insurance if we have a bad claim and our drug valuation company and our pharmacy company total cost should run somewhere a little less than 13 million for the first year that's what our estimate is so it's clear why we're doing this we can write some plans that you guys can choose or not choose to give your employees better plans perhaps less costly plans we can stabilize our premium. The board's agreed to the premium we paid in 2014 will be the most you'll pay for the next three years with the hope that we'll actually, in the second year, be able to give you a reduction in your premium. How often have you heard that about your health care in the last 15 to 20 years? Um, being that we didn't know where our health care dollars were being paid, we had wellness programs. But we don't know how effective they were, or if they were pinpointing those that were in the most need. Being self-insured, we'll know where the claims are, and we'll know where our cost factors are, and we'll go out and find those wellness programs that best meet the needs of our employees. Um, we, we, we have some ideas, but with this, we think we can buy great wellness programs and perhaps reduce our costs even more. For every $100,000 you may pay in wellness, you may get a $300,000 reduction in actual claims costs. So it's very important to look at this sort of stuff. Plus, it's really good for your employees. Um, the way we're funding this is based on actuarial studies. We're going to actually have a, we've had two actuarial studies before the program was put in place. The, the next one will, will be sometime after the first of the year. 
At which point in time we'll be looking at that point of seeing if, if our program is fully funded and we can look at whatever we may need to do either to reduce next year's premium or look at wellness program. So we'll have that done by Naxwell. It won't be Mark Ferguson saying, gee, I think we should have this level. So you have some confidence there. Uh, what are some of our other programs we deal with? Uh, I personally handle the claims for auto, general liability, and property. It comes through me personally. Uh, I have myself and one other person in the office that handles that. Len handles all the other workers' comp. We have, uh, each member has a deductible per claim between 5,000 and 25,000. We self-insure all our programs to 500,000. We go through our excess pool that I talked about earlier to 5 million, and then we buy excess over the top of that to 40 million. I will tell you right now, 40 million is about the low end of where we should be. If you've been reading the papers in the last couple of years, you've seen cities hit with $48 million in losses. Um, $42 million in, in one of the cities uh, down south, okay? Um, I think that $40 million is going to have to go up because claims costs are, and these awards are going up. But right now we're at $40 million. <coughs> Our work comp program. We're very proud of our work comp program. Uh, you pay $5,000 per claim. REMA picks up to a million dollars in any claim over the top of you, the deductible. And then we have to go out and we purchase excess insurance for any claim over a million. And we have seven? Yeah. 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 We have seven total claims over a million dollars in our program. Uh, I will tell you that we were audited by the state twice in the last six years, at which point in time at we were ranked either number one in the state or the top ten in the state in claims handling by the state. So we're really proud of that. Thanks. So how do we fund our programs? Well, we, we do it by actuarial studies. Every year we have an actuarial done. Uh, done. They look at all our programs. Uh, they tell us what they estimate the cost of it is. We take what's called a 75% confidence factor which means 75% of the time, they're gonna be right. Um, then we throw a million dollars excess over the top of that. If we have catastrophic claims that do not reach our excess, we have this cushion so that we don't go back and assess our members any additional claims cost. That's why we have it there. That's been in place for 20 years. Um, interesting last line. How many of you have insurance where they give you refunds if you don't have losses? We give refunds. Used to. Used to. Yeah. Maybe, if you're really lucky. I see on TV, so, like Allstate says they might. Um, but they may be overcharging you too. Uh, next slide. In the last 17 years, we've given $18 million back to our members. In liability, $7.7 .7 million in our workers' compensation program. Specifically, you've gotten what we charge you, we've given back $1.1 million, or 61% of your uh, premium on liabilities has been given back in the last 17 years. Not so much the last couple years, because you've had some fun losses, but um, over the last several years, you've gotten 61%. Because I missed it when I made the thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is your numbers because they weren't that good. <laughs> and it does say, well, let's return. Yes, you title at the top. I am sorry. sorry. When you do enough of these, <laughs> your mind kind of goes crazy sometimes. But you do get refunds. What are some of the other pro programs we at REMF deal with? We have property insurance. We have uh, $300 million of coverage for property. So if that major fire hits in your area and your city buildings are burned, we have up to $300 million to help what we can to take care of that. We have coverage called boiler machinery, which your public works people love. That's if a machine breaks, not wears out, but like hits by lightning or destroyed somehow. 
we there's like a five thousand dollar deductible, and then you get a replacement cost on that. So that's a great program. We have auto physical damage that's uh, up to five thousand dollars. We have employee uh, dishonesty funds. Your uh, city clerk loves that we have that because that's a requirement of all cities to have it. So we buy it for you as a group. Um, we have earthquake and flood. Talk about that a little bit. In that we are in a earthquake zone for all my cities. I have $20 million in coverage for earthquake. It cost me a million bucks to buy that per year. The reason we buy that is there's a little group called FEMA out there, and that's federal, who are supposed to take care of disasters. Well, they take care of a lot of disasters up to the point recently they have said, public agencies, if you don't go out and try to find insurance or, sh or show coverage, we may fail to refund any of your losses. Uh, we have talked to FEMA. If we have a major earthquake or flood, $20 million if we have it hit more than one city is not going to cover us. But FEMA has indicated that since that's the most we can afford, that's sufficient to toll their, their program so they'll step in and pay theoretically the difference. But if you work with FEMA, that's another. I'm not FEMA. But <laughs> The, the issue kind of is, we got this, it's costing us a lot of money, it's a stopgap, so you have coverage from the federal government. That's why we do it. Uh, we bought pollution insurance a couple years ago. That's, uh, we, it starts at $100,000, but I don't know if you've, if you've dealt with a pollution insurance, pro, or excuse me, a pollution problem. <laughs> One is, if you have pollution, the people who make money are the lawyers. Uh, and our coverage picks up 100% of the lawyer's cost. Okay? It's a, I believe the policy is $20 million for help clean up. If, if you're dealing with mills and other kind of areas that have cleanup problems, $20 million is not very much to protect. But it protects you 100% for the attorneys. We had a claim. Not, it was in our, pro, not in our program, but another city, the, they were sued and the letter left out, three and a half million dollars in, in attorney's fees were paid, and they didn't pay a dime for cleanup. They were let out of the lawsuit, but three million dollars later. That's why we have that. That doesn't apply to uh, citizen suits, like another clean water act. No. It, it also doesn't color fine or penalties from our friends at the state Water resource support. I cannot cover that. Um, so if you pollute, I can help clean it up, but I can't pay for them coming in and finding you. Uh, the new one we just got is cyber coverage. Do you guys deal with water bills or electrical bills or any bills like that? Yes. Uh -huh. Do you have any uh, identifiable information in your, in your computer on anybody, house, name, Social Security number or anything like that? This covers you if you get hacked. This is a million dollar policy. Um, we kind of thought, why would we need this? Does anybody work in the federal government? <laughs> uh, one of my, one of my uh, people in my office, uh, her husband works in the federal government. His Social Security number is now somewhere in China or Asia. They got hacked. And it's a big problem. Um, this policy helps protect you, but also if your customers get in trouble, it, it set up, sets up credit evaluation lines and things like that. If you've heard about Target's problem, this covers everything that Target had problems with. So this is brand new to us. You'll get a, uh, a questionnaire next week and be filled out. Subrogation is if somebody damages you, we go after them to recover. If we paid some money out, we go after them to recover. Uh, we recovered, I think last year, about $350,000. Uh, and it's, that's given right back to you guys and, and reduced premium because we do that. So that's what segregation is all about. What is the employee dishonesty? <laughs> well, say you, uh, your short version. Short version. If one of your employees uh, 
steals money from your treasury or wires something incorrectly or does something bad uh, fraudulent. uh, fraudulently, we recoup the cost of whatever dollars stolen. Um, and then in reality, we go after the employee for recovery. Of course, if they're in jail, that's another story. But um, this is also required but by the state for all clerks because it just is. I don't know why it just is. You can tell me that. <laughs> anyway, next. Uh, Non-casualty. Uh, we talked about health care. We also have a dental, self-insured dental plan, self-insured vision plan. We also have life and disability insurance that we, we help set up for you. Uh, that may be changing in the next few years with the changes with our health care. We're going to look at more of that, of what may be better, cost-effective. Uh, that's one of the programs I'm looking at. We have an employee assistive program. Uh, this is if your employee needs some counseling for a lot of different reasons. We pay, I think it's up to six visits. Your employees use it. We are told the usage rate for our program is 125% of normal. So our employees are using this program. They're getting counseling. It's free to them. It could be, well, whatever. There's a lot of problems that we can do. But we, we, that's part of our program. Another thing we do is we do a lot of training. Um, our, our feeling is if we can avoid accidents or injuries, it's going to save money in the long run. Uh, we have a new safety consultant on board. I believe he's been out here uh, and meeting with you and helping set up, looking at your IIPPs uh, and things like that. Uh, we're looking at safety. We're setting up uh, all sorts of stuff through your public works, trenching, Closed space training and stuff like that, and then we're paying for all that kind of training now. We also pay your your employees to go to these statewide conferences, and I'll give you a quick. Uh, Kajapa is California Joint or uh, California Joint Powers Association. They have a three-day conference for all the members of the state. Go to it. Parma is Public Employees Risk Management. Uh, they have a three-day conference, so you your employees get to go and be. 100, 200, 300 other agencies, and you get uh, three days of discussion and lecture, and you, you can hear what's going on, what's in the industry, what you may be doing different than others. That's why we send people there. Calpella is California Public Employees Labor Relations. Okay, we pay for that too. <laughs> that that's a good one because I will tell you right off. In my opinion, for liability, the place I'm most scared is employment. You've got high exposure employment cases. They cost a lot of money to litigate. Um, I'm averaging on, on cases I get, they're running me $120,000, $180,000 in litigation on employment issues. That could be wrongful termination. It could be discrimination. Those are expensive. And the problem is you have attorneys that are very precise and know what all the laws are and I will tell you, none of my cities know all the laws. We help send people there where they can learn some of them. That's why we send that. Um, we also have other uh, training programs that we're uh, setting up. We're trying to we set up consortiums uh, throughout the state or throughout the, our areas so you can have training for your public works and your HR and your, and your personnel. Why are we here? Uh, risk transfer. Uh, that's a big one. That's when your city and I have a lot of discussions about. That's when contractors want, you want to have a contractor do some work for you, but he doesn't want to take any of the risk or responsibility for doing the work, and if something breaks, he doesn't want to pay for it. Risk transfer is they will have insurance before they start the job, and they have to have adequate insurance because if they don't, they'll get sued. If they don't have insurance, you're going to get sued right after. So that's why we want to transfer risk. Um, we also have all sorts of consortiums, one for the police department, one for personnel. We have a, we have a program to help set up pre-employment fiscals throughout the state and help with um, your job analysis, analysis. And we have also have a DOT drug and alcohol pro, uh, program where because we can pull it together, uh, it costs a lot, you a lot less to have it as a group, 
plus, it, it, your employees are in a bigger group, so when they're, it's less likely that they're actually picked because each one of these are very expensive if you have it. You guys, I'm sure you have heavy, heavy equipment that meets the requirement for this. If you had to go out and get your own testing, it's, it's hundreds if not thousands of dollars. So we set it up. Okay. Um, where we've been the last two years, uh, again, we now have a 15-member board where you all have the same equal rights to vote. We're self-insured for health. We have a safety consultant online, and now we have cyber coverage. We are, I'm going to say this, we try to be really progressive. Again, you heard me say it earlier, we want to be in front of the wave and not behind the wave. So we're always looking for new things that uh, we can do to make the program better. I have a really good board of 15 members who realize this and they're very, as a group, I will tell you, that's a nasty fly. <laughs> as a group, they look at everybody before they look at themselves. And I'm really proud of that. I rarely, if ever, have had a, a member come up and say, I think this is good, but I'm not going to vote because it's not good for my city. I've never had that, or I've never heard that. No. And so it's, it's the best for the whole program. And that's a little bit longer than I want to go, but that's my, <laughs> any questions? I'm sorry, I kind yeah. of shotgun this stuff through. That's, that's good. Uh, We'll get people back up here and see if we have any questions from the dais. I'm sorry, I had support brag on that one. We have. Uh, yeah. That's all right. We. You're friends, aren't we? Yeah. As long as we're 30 miles apart. <laughs> <laughs> do uh, do we have any questions up here from the council? Yes, sir. The um, the, the fees, the the what, what would you call the uh, premiums? Mm -hmm. Uh, how are they allocated among the members? It's based on two things. It's based on loss history, going back uh, either five or ten years, depending on the program, and payroll. The payroll is used because it gives the smaller agencies the same level as big agencies. And so we use that as a smoothing agent. So when you talked about the, um, the rebates, you know, mm -hmm. when you have excess money, mm -hmm. how is that determined? The same formula? Well, we look at losses. <laughs> so it's based on your performance for the last few years or five years. And if, if your loss ratio is greater than 100, which means worse than it should be, no refund. If it's less than that, it depends on where it is from, and our bottom line is 75. Between 175, where you fall in, you'll get your percentage of your refund based on your loss versus. So we can be proactive in determining how much we pay and how much we get back by being very careful and always mindful of that. Always. Good, thank you. Well, thank you very much for, or do we have any questions from the community? I, I just want to say, since you're here and Elena's here, um, REMF has just been a tremendous resource for the city. Um, you know, certainly predates me, but since I've been here for nearly six years, they're very approachable, very easy to uh, talk with and work through whatever issues or questions we have or just a need to understand a situation better. And um, we, we've enjoyed the relationship very much and certainly the, the resource that you've provided us over the years. Thank you. Thank you for, yeah, for thank coming you. up. And Given us an update this evening. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. I'm driving. Good evening. Have a, have a safe drive home. Just on drive. Oh. Oh. Where are you? Is it? Well, there it is. That's covered under cyber. <laughs> so uh, we're pulling all the consent calendar tonight, right? So we have some informational reports, but uh, rights to appeal. 
uh, persons that are dissatisfied with the decisions of the city council may have a right of review of that decision by a court. The city's adopted 1094.6 of the Code of Civil Procedure, which generally limits 90 days the time within decisions of boards and agencies may be challenged. We're going to move right along to uh, city manager's reports and recommendations, I think. Yes. And uh, what's, what do you got? Uh, first, I'll start with some verbal reports. Um, and just to segue on Remus' presentation and, and uh, reference to the training they provide, we are having such a uh, one such training next Wednesday, September 2nd, uh, through the Liebert Cassidy um, uh, Law Firm uh, Legal Consortium. And we have two sessions that day, one in the morning that's geared more for management staff and then one in the afternoon that's geared for really all city employees. And it's, it's all about what it is, what it means to be a public um, entity employee and all that that entails. So I, um, I think this is an important topic for all of our employees and I would like to close City Hall that afternoon so that all employees may attend that training which will be hosted here in the community center. So I'm, I'm uh, looking for a blessing, if you will, to close City Hall from noon to 5 p.m. What date? Uh, Wednesday, September 2nd, next Wednesday. So if anybody Do we need any, to take action? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any objections, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, Let's see, John's Place uh, appeal, I reported at the last meeting that that was noticed for September 9th, um, and I was informed that two, two of you will not be present for that meeting, so we uh, informed the uh, applicants of that. Uh, essentially, they have the right to go forward at that meeting as noticed, or to have it continued to another meeting, and, and we were recommending that it, it be continued to the September 23rd meeting uh, where we would open the hearing at the ninth, at the meeting on the 9th and then continue it to the 23rd. I was just informed this afternoon that the applicants actually desire to proceed with the hearing on the 9th. So uh, it's their prerogative and, and that's their desire at this point in time. Um, the pool season officially ended last Saturday and uh, we had a very good season. I think we kind of got off to a little bit of a, of a bumpy start with just trying to get everything in place, but it was a good season. Um, great staff, most of whom were returning from last year. I stopped by Saturday afternoon to chat with them and uh, the new lifeguards, I was told that they just, um, great training. Um, great response from them, and they're very enthusiastic about returning next year. So I'm, I'm proud of the staff, full staff. Um, airport day is going to be held on uh, Sunday, September 13th from 10 to 4, and that's been planned for a while. I think I've previously reported on that, but uh, since our last council meeting, we received notice that um, the ribbon cutting for the new hospital is also going to be held on the same day. That's scheduled from 1 to 4 p.m. So, I mean, both are doable, uh, but just a heads up about that. Uh, let's see, um, John Sherman is uh, our, our building officials, also our floodplain administrator, and um, he reported uh, recently that he'll be attending a training back east the end of September. Um, but we're trying to put together a meeting with um, all of our stakeholders regarding preparations for this coming um, wet season, which we're told will be hitting us earlier, uh, actually in September. Really? Yes, oh. that's the latest report on that. Potentially. Uh, let's see. And sticking with the topic of the code enforcement, um, there's been some uh, recent uh, sort of uprising in the community about uh, an increase in code enforcement activities. Um, I don't believe that there's been an increase in code enforcement activities, but perhaps it's getting, getting some attention lately because of the nature of, of our code enforcement. And so I just wanted to clarify for everyone that staff is tasked with um, enforcing the exist existing municipal code. 
Our code enforcement program is complaint driven, not unlike our police department. Somebody calls in with a complaint and we have a duty to look into the matter and see if any further measures are warranted. In some cases they are and in some cases they are not. Um, so until, uh, if and when rather, uh, there are amendments to the code which do happen from time to time and that's under the city council's purview. Um, it's staff's duty to enforce our existing code, and it's it's a pretty straightforward program. Um, let's see. Um, yesterday morning, we had vi a visit from the state water board officials. Officials from the state water board is a better way to put that. Um, they came uh, uh, because these were the good guys. Right. Yeah. That's just <laughs> right. This wasn't a result of any issue we were having. Um, Senator McGuire has been a strong advocate for the city of Willits um, for us to, you know, continue to, to seek funding for various water related projects, especially with the drought. And so a couple months back, we went to Sacramento at his uh, invitation where we met with um, some folks from the State Water Board. Um, those were I, from the financing division, and I think we reported that that, that meeting wasn't necessarily very encouraging. Um, we found that because we still have water and we still have money, because we managed our resources pretty well, um, that we weren't inclined to get additional funding. Um, but Senator McGuire has persisted, and so yesterday we, um, we hosted uh, I think three visitors from out of the area, and um, and Chief uh, Fire Chief McGann was there. Um, John Sherman, our building official, um, myself, Mayor Burton, um, and Rod, anyway, so we Rod, Rod, is there. Rod, our public works director. <laughs> so we went out to after meeting here for a bit. Um, we went out to the groundwater treatment plant and uh, showed, showed that off to them and then out to the Elias Well. And then we went over to Main Street and drove that stretch that, and that's really uh, such a huge priority right now and we really em emphasize that to them. Um, I think the meeting was productive. Um, they didn't write us a check at the end of it. We weren't expecting that they would, but it was a very good uh, meeting in terms of clarifying what their process is, um, the transition that they've been going in, moving really from more of a regulation-based uh, um, program to a policy-based program. And they were very encouraging with us about um, the um, feasibility of several projects that we have that, that may get funding. So we are planning to submit, a, it's a basically a one-stop application process um, here in the very near future um, that would be considered for a number of different projects with a number of different funding sources. So we'll keep you posted on that end. And then lastly, um, we're going through some technology upgrades um, citywide. And uh, so that process is just getting underway um, with Minnesota City County IS um, Division. And um, we're, we're pretty excited about that. We think that we're going to end up with a, a much better um, technology system and support services and one that uh, really puts all of the city departments on the same network and uh, so anyway we'll keep you posted on that end as well that will, process will take uh, probably about three months or so that's what I have that's, that's it for verbal reports that's it for verbal reports mm -hmm. and then we have an informational report on the regarding the city's use of herbicides right um, so this is in response to Councilmember Strong's request for us to review the city's use of herbicides. Um, so staff has put together a memo that's attached to the agenda summary that really talks about the city's wetland mitigation plan because that's really the, the predominant area um, where uh, herbicides um, called to be used. And, and so it addresses alternatives to herbicide use. Um, I'm going to ask that uh, Rod come up and be available to address this. Um, essentially, what we're looking for tonight is 
a direction from the council regarding next steps in this matter. Um, our wetlands mitigation plan was adopted in 2009 that went through a vetting process with our regulatory agencies um, and uh, we believe that any material change to that plan would require a similar vetting process um, through those same agencies. Uh, so what we're proposing um, short of that would be a staff level um, practice to utilize mechanical and manual methods for weed abatement wherever it's practical to do so. The memo does get into um, what the implications are if we rely on that solely and, uh, and the, the cost and possible complications with doing that. We're in year three of our um, five-year monitoring plan. And so there, there's some concern about uh, going in a different direction, essentially, that would, uh, could compromise our, our monitoring plan and put us in a position to have to start over with a five-year plan. Um, but again, I'd like to have Rod, and I don't know if there's anyone else um, staff-wise that would like to elaborate on this. Rod, do you have a second? Um, Adrian pretty much explained the, everything, uh, but at this point, given recent some recent, um, uh, I would say some recent changes in in direction uh, locally, we've we've decided to um, explore other methods of weed abatement in our mitigation. Uh, wetlands, but um, at the end of the day, we are required to meet the the mandates as set forth in our mitigation plan, and we would like that's well, I wouldn't say we would like, but <coughs> we may at some point in the future have to come back to council and talk about um, using herbicides once again. Um, we have some we've talked about using goats and we've talked about uh, some other ways of um, manually manual removal of blackberries and bull thistles etc but um, it is labor intensive I think one of the things that is unique for us is that we have the the Chamberlain Creek crew that we can call on which is they they do uh, they do good work and um, they're very efficient and um, I would say that that's that's where we're at right now I don't know um, in light of Caltrans decision we've I've spoken with Caltrans uh, mitigation contractor about what they propose to do and um, we just plan to follow suit so do you see this as having a, a causing change orders in our mitigation contracts? Uh, I don't think so. Um, and I spoke to Adrian earlier about any cost increase, et cetera, and we really don't know until we go through um, go through a cycle, a year of, of weed removal. Um, and, um, you know, we might find that it's, it's too costly, and we may find that it's um, too demanding on staff resources, etc. We may have to look to go a different direction. But um, are these are these duties now being performed by in-house staff or are they done by contract? Um, it's kind of it's a mix right now. We we use the Chamberlain Creek crew a lot for the actual removal and as it states in the in the, in the middle in the past, uh, uh, Restoration Resources has brought a, a licensed um, uh, herbicide person out to to um, use herbicide on a limited herbicides on a limited basis. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. Um, I don't. 
I don't, I don't foresee significant cost increase annually. The potential is that, that we could have to extend this beyond two more years. So that's the risk we run. And I, don't, I shouldn't say the risk we run because we will not, um, we won't uh, let, um, we won't fail in our mitigation effort. The best way I would describe it. We'll find a way to make it work. Um, Ron? Yeah, so, so you're referring to the five year mitigation plan. Right. But the fact is that after the five years is up, these weeds and things, they're going to come back. So there will need to be, I mean, I assume it's not the intention to just let them grow wild, is it? I, I can't answer that question. I don't. I don't know what. I honestly don't know what our requirement is beyond the beyond the five years. Well, I'm thinking. Well, the mitigation has to do with, as I understand it, planting trees and shrubs and things like that to recreate a wetland environment. And once they're established, then they're established. But in addition to that, you're still going to have all the weeds and blackberries and things that are going to do their thing as well. And you know, you've lived here long enough, you live, you leave your blackberries alone. They they have a way of coming back. So I guess my question is that this isn't about the mitigation. This is about what we want happening out at that place. And would we be going back there and still treating these weeds and things? I think it's beyond fun. I mean, I, I don't mean to jump to conclusions, but I think it's or or the goal is to meet the requirements of our mitigation plan. Right. And if we fulfill all of the requirements of our mitigation plan in five years, then that is supposed to have demonstrate that the the, the plan, the planting or the the changes you made to the ecology are, are now permanent, and okay. you no longer have an obligation to monitor and control those. I'm wrong. That's so whatever happens afterwards with other plants just happens. Is that uh, no. I'm, I'm well? I mean, I think the keeper of that record is is Rod, and he's saying he, he, he's not completely familiar with what that is. Okay, I'm not an expert, but I would I would say that the the, the trees are mature enough to withstand um, to to make it through. Uh, the, the blackberry push from from the creek side. Competing so basically, species. nature will take its course, and that you know we've done what we had to do, and yeah. we're good. Okay. And it becomes a natural. You had a comment. Uh, yeah, I had a couple of comments. One is that I I would assume that if uh, after the five year commitment, then we don't have the outside resource agencies sort of giving us a scorecard, but but our staff would want to make sure things are done along the okay, so it might be there might be some but lesser level of uh, maintenance going on in perpetuity but i i think it's wonderful and my other main comment is i think it's really good that at the staff level you are choosing to find a way to do this and meet the mitigation requirements without using herbicides because i think that's what um, i was hoping for and i i hoping you don't have to come back and ask for herbicides later because I, I really think that the trade-off is not worth it. At least to me it is not because the more I found out about the kinds of herbicides and um, the kind of old science and mostly um, corporate uh, supplied science on which those herbicides have been approved, um, the less I feel confident that that's a good thing for our, our wetlands and our the Lake Valley, our, our aquifers, um, the people that work there, all of that. So I, I think, um, I, I feel, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we would adopt a policy that in the future we simply would not use herbicides, but for the time being I'm very satisfied that the staff is, is proceeding basically on that, uh, using mechanical and manual methods um, as, the, as the standard here, which then, you know, we'll have to come back to you and it, just not necessarily if, 
if we think there's a need to use herbicides, but just regular updates because we are making a decision at this point to rely solely on mechanical and manual methods, and we're going to be monitoring that very closely uh, at the staff level uh, because, as Rod said, failure it's not an is not an option. <laughs> Um, and we are in year three of this year, uh, five-year monitoring plan, and so we want to make sure that we're staying. We, right now, I think we're about an 80% su su success rate, which is where we want to be. Um, so we don't want to backslide on that. Yeah. The one other comment that I, uh, I don't know that there's an extensive history yet or uh, experience yet, but I think that solarization, which is you when know, you cut the blackberries down instead of just doing it again the next year and again the next year, it, and instead of applying herbicides, is to use plastic and basically uh, solar, right, and basically fry the roots as well. Put plastic there. bags out there. You put, you yeah. put uh, good grade plastic out there, but it, there has been at least one study that showed that was very effective and it only required <coughs> one year. So you did not have to have multiple applications of herbicides. So I, I'm Definitely. hoping that that is something you would look into. Well, I, I'm, I would just remind the council that, that the city has a variety of obligations of vegetation management uh, throughout the community, and this this project out here is 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 a, you know the type of thing that we take on you know once every 15 years or so we did a mitigation plan and project when we built the new water when we built the new uh, centennial dam and uh, we did a i mean i think we had a little mitigation when we even took a little property down on railroad avenue but but this was another you know a major one but but the city owns a lot of right of way and the city owns a lot of of uh you know place where storm waters need to travel and uh, and <clears throat> and vegetation management isn't just about about unpopular plants that are in a in a special area it's it's a it's about uh, it's about fire control it's a lot of, a lot of it has to do with to me it has to do with with uh, having defensible space and uh, so I, I I just caution the city that, that you know in a, in an instance where you say well let's let's not use herbicides in that deal it, I would I think it has to be a much more complete discussion before it becomes some sort of a policy decision at the city that that they're not going to to use those and and I'd like to, this to be interpreted just as for what it is, is that we're going to try it for a year or two and see if we can stay on track with this project to make sure that it, we pass all of our obligations to the resource agencies. But uh, that, that's, that's my, my thought. Holly? I just had a couple questions, and I apologize if you discussed this uh, before I came in. Um, Thank you for the memo. I think that pretty much ex explains everything. Just out of curiosity, can we choose to leave blackberries, or would that require a change to the mitigation plan? I mean, we all know that blackberries are ridiculously hard to get rid of, and I know that they're invasive, but is that an option? To say, like, we just, we're choosing to leave them? Or would that re require an amendment to the... I don't know that it would require an amendment, but if we chose to leave the blackberries, I don't think we would be successful in our mitigation right. effort. With a competing. Can you repeat right. that, please? I said I don't, I don't think it would require an amendment to leave the blackberries, but I believe if we l just left the blackberries alone, we would not be successful in our mitigation. I forget that. Right, this it's a, um, because it's a competing species, so they would, I mean, it grows over the top of the yeah. trees and the trees die and our success requirement is 75% survival rate and right now the last check was 80. Um, if, if somebody else would like to come up and talk about it. No, you're doing good. <laughs> you're doing good. But um, no, uh, um, 
I would I would go back to the to the to the bottom line. We we created 24 acres because we took 18. So we created 24 acres of mitigated wetlands, and um, at the end of the day, it's it's our it's our responsibility to our our ratepayers to be successful in our mitigation in, in a in a cost effective cost effective and a reasonable amount of time. So um, we 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 would. Uh, endeavor to to be sure to do that as quickly and as for the least amount of money as possible so thank you yeah do we have any other questions up here I, um, I, yeah uh, you, what you did is create or what was done was to create a wetland from a non-wetland and this five-year mitigation plan is to assure that the wetland takes and it, and it becomes a real wetland. Is that, is that, in essence, the description of what happened here? Well, if I can give a shot at that, I mean, it, it, is, to, it is to change the, the floral scape of that area to be reflective of plants that are, are representative of a, of a wetland well, I, aquaculture. I, it's not, it, it's, it's not uh, you know, if, and I think it is with native plants. I think on top of it, the, the, the goal is that it be native plants, and and non-native plants are not, you know, they're not considered part of the natural. Well, I, I guess what my what I was asking for is this a real wetland that we've created? It's well, we don't have. I mean, it's, that's really beyond the scope of the. It doesn't really make any difference anymore. I mean, we. Well, I have a reason they, for asking the question. Well, the thing is, I mean, it's that's that. That was an argument that we should have had 15 years ago, if you Can wanted to have. Ask the Can you? You'll have your your chance to speak if you'd like to speak. Um. I would like to defer to Jane Valerius. <laughs> She's our, our botanist, and she have she was nice enough to come tonight, and she would have much a much probably a much better and more complete answer for you. So yeah, I. I there's a reason for the question, obviously. Um, so, I'm not sure. So, I'll start with the wetland question. Um, yeah. So you, you, Did we create a wetland, a real? If we can look at it and say this is a wetland. So, the Army Corps definition of a wetland is uh, an area that has a dominance of wetland plants, has wetland soils, and wetland hydrology. So, you have to have three these three factors. So you can have seasonal wetlands, which a lot of the wetlands on the wastewater treatment plant are, they're seasonal wetlands. I think a lot of us think wetlands, they think cattail marshes, like the enhancement wetlands on the treatment plant are beautiful examples, right, of a wetland. Um, but seasonal wetlands often don't seem to the eye much of a wetland, but they are, they do meet those three criteria. So when we did the, you know, the Little Lake Valley really is, a little lake valley <laughs> and the majority of the valley as when we delineated it or at least the majority of the area on the wastewater treatment plant site turned out to be to qualify as wetlands so there were really very few areas that didn't qualify as wetlands and so the city was really really limited as to where they could create new wetlands and we looked at watershed we looked at a lot of different things areas up you know where there might be other opportunities but we were restricted to what you had on the site and um, so the the concept was to the areas that weren't meeting the criteria were at a slightly higher elevation and and so we lowered the elevation and the idea was that then the water would be sitting there and you create kind of like a basin so we're the wetlands that have cre been created out there are meant to look like the other wetlands and they do pretty much um, it, the Little Lake Valley, I will say, over the years, because I've been working, you know, doing some of this work out here for, I think, since 2000, so 15 years, it, things have actually had dried out quite a bit, in, and I think, you know, part of it is the drought. But um, the, the wetland mitigation plan sets forth criteria, and it's based on um, vegetation cover data and that's what I've been doing for the last three years is going out and measuring the cover 
and then I match that up against what the success criteria are set forth in the mitigation plan. And at least for these last three years, we have been meeting those success criteria. So as far as the way that we set it up in the plan, and as far as the agencies are concerned, the city is meeting the success criteria uh, for wetlands. So yeah, the areas that we that the city created are meeting the success criteria. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that, that's good. I mean, w the reason I asked the question is I've been hearing a lot, and uh, and we all have that man and woman cannot create wetlands. They are a natural phenomenon, and it sounds to me what you said is that indeed you did create wetlands. Yes, we're meeting the success criteria. So once again, there's criteria that were set forth and we're meeting those criteria. And that's how, that's how it's being judged. Would that be a, yeah, you did create a wetland? Yes. Okay. But, but wetlands by definition are trying to become uplands. Well, unfortunately, again, here in the Little Lake Valley, because of the sediment deposition, it, is, it is, definitely is becoming a problem for, okay. for, the, for those areas. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and these wetlands that you created will function like natural wetlands, I assume? Yes, they're meant to function exactly like the, ex the existing wetlands that are out there. Okay. Good. Thank you. That mm -hmm. clears up a lot of misconceptions that I've been hearing. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, I think it's because, I think it's just because on a visual basis, if you look at them, that, you know, once again, people can see a cat cattails and toolies and everything like that, and, you know, you can see the standing water and you can see, yeah, this is a wetland. But like, if anyone has seen vernal pools, because we have, there's a lot of vernal pools, like in you know in other areas, you know, in the winter time, it's easy to identify the vernal pool. It's a you know it's a slight depression in a grassland area. In the summertime, you wouldn't even think it was there. It, you know, the vegetation, everything changes completely. But it is a wetland. It is okay. classified as a wetland. G getting back to herbicides a little bit, um, if you do use herbicides as mitigation out there, will you air bomb it with, with spray planes or, I'm being facetious, <laughs> um, how, how, how in fact would it be applied? Okay, so once again in the mitigation plan, um, the criteria that were set forth were that um, we would do mechanical as well as um, chemical control, the herbicide control. So, and what the city has been doing is going in and in, like with, with the con crews and, and with restoration resources, been removing the vegetation and then applying herbicide to try to get, you know, to get into the root systems to try to really get the plants from, you, trying to control them from coming back. Part of the problem is that, you know, the weeds, the different weeds have different flowering seasons and unless you really have someone watching and being out there and 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 coming at the right season like right now unfortunately you know, I was out today um, doing the vegetation counts and uh, there's a lot of thistle out there that's already gone to seed well all that seed sits in this you know it's actually a very long-term viability so you know doing one weeding once or weeding twice just doesn't make it you really have to be on top of the weeding and it's a long-term control and just to kind of get back to some of the questions the mitigation plan has a five-year monitoring program, and you're right. After five years, if we meet all of our success, if you meet all your success criteria, technically the agencies should sign off on your project. Now, the mitigation plan has a long-term <laughs> maintenance requirement, and that maintenance requirement includes grazing. And I discussed this year with the city um, to implement grazing because technically the wetland areas are actually five years old. We just didn't start the monitoring until three years ago. Um, so the, the areas are mature enough now and actually beyond mature and, and could really use grazing as a way of controlling the, there's so much vegetation out there now, the thatch is so thick that it's actually harming, you know, it's actually kind of harmful because it's suppressing the vegetation. So. If we can get grazing, if we can figure a way to get grazing back out there, and that is part of the long-term management plan in, in, for the area, um, I think one that'll help tremendously with the weed control. It'd be a very nice natural way to do it. You don't have to play herbicides. <laughs> it makes some ranchers happy too. Yeah, and make some ranchers happy, and um, and also provide some fire protection as well. So I'm just going to read this first sentence um, under long-term management. It says grazing, fire management, invasive species control 
Grazing and brush clearing have historically been the fire prevention and invasive species control management of choice for the outlet in Mill Creek floodplains. Future grazing and brush clearing in the wetland areas will be, um, will be managed consistent with the goals of wetland establishment in these areas. Future lease of grazing rights will be adaptive and adjustable based on vegetation monitoring results. So you have, you know, you have the um, ability here to use that as a, as a control. And the concrete have been very effective. The, the thing is that it really does take, in terms of staff time, um, someone who really stays on top of, you know, be, once again, because the weeds come in different times and different, time, you know, flowering periods, you kind of have to have be someone aware of, you know, when are they starting to come out? When do they need to be mowed before they flower? <laughs> so, you know, the seeds just don't disperse out. Um, and like I said, they, the seeds, once the seeds are in the soil and they already are, there's, it takes years, you know, before they get depleted. So it is a long term. The truth is that the weed control is a long-term management. Jay, um, I was having a conversation with uh, one of our staff members recently about grazing and uh, you know goat grazing compared to, to cattle grazing. And um, what I was told is the cattle, you know, goats are going to eat any, everything. We don't want them eat, eating the plantings that, are, that we're trying to be successful with. So do you have a, um, an opinion on what type of grazing would be best? Um, well, it's interesting because we were talking about it today. Um, and uh, yeah, the goats are great because they will eat anything, <laughs> including a lot of things that you know, other animals won't eat. Uh, they, unfortunately, they will eat everything. And, and there are plants that we don't want them to eat. We don't want them to eat the woody riparian plants that we have spent, that you guys have spent so much money, time, and effort you know, to get there. So, and apparently, they're not so easy to control in terms of fencing. Um, so it's, it's the fact that they're the management of, uh, you, you really have to have someone there really managing them and make, keeping them out of the riparian. Shepherd. Now, you have to do the same thing. <laughs> you have to do the same thing with sheep and, and cattle, but I think it's a little easier with them because you can set up the electric fence and they're more likely to not cross that electric fence line, whereas apparently goats will find a way under, over, you know, and so they're, they're a lot harder to control. Signage won't work. <laughs> <laughs> they don't read too well. <laughs> All you have comment, or, um, if Jane's done, or, um, I, as I mentioned before, I think this was really informative, and I agree that a policy would probably be warranted. But I don't feel like we have the staff time right now to to really get into the level of discussion that we would need to do. I think there is a certain amount of there's a certain amount of trust factor. You know, staff is aware of the council's use towards herbicides, and as has been explained, you're going to come back to us should there be an additional concern. But at this point, I don't think we have the resources to get into the full policy, let alone go back. I mean, the this mitigation plan is well underway, as, as has been described. So I think it's really great information and it would probably be who us to have you back you know in sure. say a year from now to, mm -hmm. to see how things are going mm -hmm. um, and I'm obviously interested in hearing from the public that's come to speak to this particular issue but I I think we should just take the staff's recommendation and report at this point as far as tonight and not take any action I'd like to open this up to the public before we can keep this moving along. Do we have anybody from the community like to address this? Please come up and introduce yourself. Try and keep your comments to three or four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Brian Weller, local resident. Um, a couple of questions to Jane. Um, what are the criteria? If you could spell those out. And then the second question, I think I heard you say that mechanical means are being preferred to um, take care of some of the invasive species. And then uh, herbicide will be used to go to the roots. So herbicides would, in fact, be used. Now, if that is the case, what is the half-life of these herbicides? And if the air is open for grazing, what are the implications of that herbicide residual as far as the 
um, the, the cattle are concerned and also the watershed is concerned. And what, um, obviously, what kind of herbicides um, are being used? Could you answer those for us? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up. Yeah. Jane, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to come up to the microphone or to speak. Or could we so wait and get all the questions up No, first. well, I'm <laughs> just take them as they come here. Okay. And hopefully we can get through this. So the success criteria have to do with the percent covered by plants that are considered to be wetland plants. And the wetland plants, uh, there is a, um, a listing provided by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that gives a status for each plant species. So when I do the vegetation cover data, I, I have a, um, a sample quadrat that I look at, and then I s estimate the percent cover, and it's a visual estimate. Um, and so um, th this is a su success criteria. So for seasonal, we have two kinds of wetlands, seasonal wetland um, and then rush-dominated seasonal wetland. They're both seasonal wetlands, but one has more of this one species, the rush species. So the seasonal wetland is 70 to 100% covered by herbaceous wetland plants, mostly fact to facultative wet species. So there's three categories of wetland plants, facultative, facultative wetland, and obligate. And they all have to do with the probability that they occur in wetland areas. Rush-dominated seasonal wetlands have 80 to 100% covered by herbaceous wetlands. So the truth is that we have mostly seasonal wetlands that we've created and not so much of the rush-dominated, but we have been meeting that cover criteria. Um, see if I can remember all the questions that you asked. <laughs> um, herbicides. Herbicides, yes. We, um, Rest Restoration Resources is the contractor that the city has been using, and they have been using Garlon 3A and uh, Roundup Custom for, for herbicide application. Um, I am not a licensed pest control applicator, so um, that's why they have Restoration Resources doing that. Because so they've they all been licensed. used. They have, they, been. they have been used in the past, yes. And as, well, mm -hmm. as of, I guess, this year or last year, um, whenever the last time the, 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 they went through and did the, the work. Um, but what happens first is they go through and they cut the vegetation, you know, to really um, to get it to, well, hopefully to do a lot of different things. One, they try to get rid of the seeds, and then also to um, make it easier, you know, to up make the application. And the application is very, um, it's not broadcast. They don't, you know, they don't spray in a broadcast area because there are plants that we don't want impacted. So it's a very applied application to the weed that we're targeting, which is mostly like bull thistle, poison hemlock, um, blackberry, Himalayan blackberry. Um, we have some Klamath weed out there. Uh, so the really invasive, uh, plant species are the ones that have been targeted. targeted. It's, tar it's targeted. And what's the half-life of the, these herbicides, like Roundup? I'm, I, I'd have to look it up. I'd have to look it up. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Have you come across this before? Come across? The use of herbicides? Yes. Medicine. Yes, it's pretty much universally used. I, I mean, every, pretty much every project I've ever worked on, herbicide application is, is, is allowed. Yes, I guess. Yes. <laughs> I, I will say for one, there I had one project in Marin County where they didn't allow um, use of herbicides. Thank you, Jane. Do you, have, do you have your time about used up? Do you have any other questions we can need answered? I'd like no. You, you okay. you're welcome, Mr. Just the impact on on uh, cattle. I don't. I, she's. I don't know if she would no. profess to be an expert on that. No, and they're not. No. They don't have. They're not currently not grazing out there. Do we have any other public comments? Hi, I am Cynthia Reiser Jennings, and um, thank you so much for all this discussion and the opportunity to speak on herbicides. Ah, there we go. Oh, my computer's feeling a little overloaded. Just one moment here. Um, so I prepared a little talk about glyphosate. Dr. Anthony Samsell is an expert research scientist who is passionate about farming, gardening, and agriculture. He has also done contract work for the EPA and as a hazard, 
hazardous materials expert. He has worked for the United States Army Corps of Engineers, the United States Navy, and the U.S. Coast Guard. Besides his career in science, he has also owned and operated several farms in New England, and it was his first-hand experience that led him to begin investigating the effects of glyphosate in the first place. Here's a quote for him, from him. Um, I started using glyphosate myself commercially around the farm and my properties back in the late 70s or 80s when it first came to the market, he says. I believed the hype, like all the other farmers and people around the world do, that glyphosate is as safe as salt and it broke down into harmless chemicals that did no harm. I believed all that stuff I s until I started studying the chemical when I became sick from using it. Being a research scientist, a chemist, um, and a chemist, I knew what to look for. Having worked in public health, I was familiar with how chemicals had effects on the human body and on animals, so I started approaching it from that aspect. I asked the EPA, as a research scientist, to be able to access the documents um, that they used in their approval process um, for his own research. I was denied by the Environmental Protection Agency initially, he said. Eventually, he gained access to the pertinent papers, and he found that Monsanto knew in 1981 that glyphosate caused adenomas and carcinomas in the rats that they've studied. The highest incidence of tu tumorogenic growth occurred in the pituitary gland, specifically pituitary, kidney, breast, testicular, thyroid tumor tumors, and thymic hyperplasia. Because what I have seen in those documents, it clearly shows that Monsanto knew in 1981 that glyphosate caused tumorogenic growth and carcinomas in multiple organs and tissues. At the rate we're going, using these chemicals so widely in our environment and in our food, we are going to kill billions of people, Dr. Samsel says. In a very important study conducted by the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer, data was analyzed from studies that have been conducted on glyphosate over the past several decades. The results were sobering, and now whole countries are banning Roundup and glyphosate because of the disastrous health effects this chemical is having on people and the environment. The Netherlands, France, Brazil, Sri Lanka, Bermuda are all following the lead of the World Health Organization and credible medical journals today, such as the Lancet Oncology, in determining that glyphosate, the main ingredient in Monsanto's Roundup pesticide, is probably carcinogenic to humans. Cynthia, are you about close to Rana? I am close. I have two small paragraphs. Thank you. I understand that it may cost more not to use herbicides. This is important to realize. However, it is also important to realize that this is a short-term cost consideration. The long-term cost question is, what is the cost of sick people, of sick loved ones, both now and far into the future? Poison is poison. Glyphosate or Roundup is clearly poison, and all use of this poison by the city of Willits in our precious environment, especially on wetlands, should be stopped. Our health and the future health of our land and people depends on you, our city council, making this wise decision now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else to address the council? Um, Freddie Long, Willits. Um, I just, I, I now have a question because I'm a little bit confused that Ron said, yeah, Ron? you made a statement that we're, you're not going to use herbicides any time from now on till it, it's deemed necessary. Have to, what? Unless we absolutely Unless you have to, have but to. you're going to come back and talk to us, talk to us. Okay. But then, I'm sorry. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your report. It was very informative. But then I got the impression that you are going to be using. Is that, did I miss something? No, just, they have been using them. Okay. At this point. Okay. But, uh, okay, thank you for clarifying that. That's, Okay, thank you. Anybody else this evening? My name is Tim Rice. Okay, this use of herbicides kind of puzzles me. Um, so, you know, what is a herbicide? Well, you know, it's poison, okay? We put poison on the land to kill plants, and I know it rains in this area, so it's going to get into the water. And maybe wash downstream, maybe some get in the aquifer. Some water will evaporate, so it'll be in the air. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, air is really important to me. I, I try holding my breath, I can't make it important, you know, a minute or so. And, and 
you know, air is important. Uh, water, I can't do without water. Won't last but a few days. Um, the soil, I mean, that's where our food comes from. So, you know, this is, this is our life support system, air, soil, and water. Um, I've heard the term standard, standard practice. Um, and some might say, well, it's legal. Well, gosh, you know, slavery used to be legal too. It wasn't right. Uh, you know, women were considered property. I mean, that, that was the law of the day uh, 100 years ago. That wasn't right. Back in World War II, everything Hitler did in his country was legal. You know, so legal isn't good enough. So my question is, by what standard is it okay to poison our life support system? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, I think that we are wrap this item up. I think that the direction was stated by the public works director, what practice is going to be moving forward. And uh, it's not a specific item unless someone cares. And it's not agendized to be an action item. I think mean, we've heard from the community. I think all the council members have weighed in. So I think we will move on to the department recommendations. Anything from the city clerk? Yes, I would like to Well, you do have an excuse this month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I still should have them together. So I don't have them all in the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Anything from finance? Yes. Legal? No. Public safety chief? That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to report that our own Jake Donahue just got back. Um, he and Chris Wilkes went off to the incident response to terrorist bombing school oh at New Mexico Tech Energetic Materials Research Testing Center, which is at New Me Mexico Tech. It's a grant funded both airfare, per diem, uh, hotel and flight there, et cetera, there. For both of them to head on over there. In light of our little incident here, um, we've, uh, the fire chief and I found this grant, and I actually sent someone before years ago, but it brought back a lot of good information, and they actually became instructors uh, out of this. Yeah, they're not uh, bomb technicians, but they've learned a lot to bring back. So um, if you get a chance to ask either of those gentlemen some questions, they'll they brought back some videos and some cool stories. Good. Um, just kind of a reminder, school's in session for the television audience, so please slow down around the uh, schools. We've been, we see a lot of police officers near the schools. Uh, all the massive amounts of police officers we have uh, will be deployed <laughs> at any one time. But um, we are stopping folks also for Blosser Lane. Uh, Everybody, it's kind of a madhouse. The, I apologize, the city did not put the school there. The school put itself there and uh, years ago predates me as chief, but uh, it, parking is hard there and when people park in the red zone, it narrows the traffic there and then people don't pay attention to the kids and parents crossing there. So I just kind of put it out to the community, slow down around the schools and get there in plenty of time to drop off and pick up your child so you're not in a hurry. Um, I want to kind of let you know that I'm, we're bidding farewell to one of our officers. Uh, Matthew Sidzik is leaving us for the city of Redwood City. What? Um, Matt's been here about, about four years and uh, in fact he even bought a home here and uh, he's heading down there for greener pastures and he will be missed. Uh, he's uh, Good officer, one of my uh, bilingual guys, fluent in Russian. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then lastly, um, I, I kind of, I know it's kind of hard because we've been doing 90 degree weather lately, but they're forecasting El Nino weather. And, you know, uh, I, I look back and Jeff Smith, when I used to talk to him, we, we talked about the community needs to prepare itself for wet weather, fires, et cetera, and have plans of action of what they're gonna do. And um, 
it's not up to government totally to, to take care of them and they need to do some pre-planning ahead of time. So people need to start winterizing their homes and if it floods, where it normally floods in town, I mean, it usually it floods and water comes up high and comes down quick, but uh, people need to do some planning ahead of time. I, I always kind of think when it's pouring like buckets, and we have the sandbag station up here, and I don't think you're going to shovel enough sandbags to make a difference um, when it's coming down like cats and dogs. So I think people kind of need to plan on that. We're kind of looking at our emergency plan right now, and I think Again, it's kind of an ironic time to put it out, but I figure I don't want to be in I told you so mode, but that's where I'm at. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, Larry. Uh, Fury, I want to thank you for the police officers at the school. It's really nice to see them there. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, officers. Uh, you might not be the right person, but since you brought it up about the, the storm, uh, the city should probably be a I mean, we're being proactive on city-owned property, but I'm wondering if we could develop some kind of a program for the public. You know, you mentioned a few things, but I think it's got to be maybe formulated a little more so people know what to do. Do you think? Uh, and that's why we're going to be meeting here in the next couple of weeks to okay. start. And, and you've got a flood uh, plain administrator that's going off to get some excellent training. I don't mean to take his thunder, but uh, that'll give us some ideas. Um, at least what uh, FEMA and uh, who are the other folks uh, that uh, tell us where it floods? So. Well, the famous. <coughs> yeah, so. Right, thanks, oh, Jerry. I, I had one comment on. Yeah. Uh, that I guess John Sherman's going to be off learning about flood control issues during September, and that's when we might have flood problems, <laughs> uh, although I don't know when, you know, we, we can't predict exactly when that's going to happen, but um, I hope that we have backup plans for while you're away. I have no control over the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> or, or over the rains, I think. Yeah. Okay. So part of our emergency operations plan that we're underway with trying to get updated is, is to prepare for any of these types of events, whether it be earthquake or flood. Um, or any of the fire, uh, and everybody at the city, especially the management staff, has a has a specific role in in those types of events, and it includes our partners at the county level and um, regional OES and at the state level. So we we are conversing with the county folks about this already, and uh, we'll. You know, we're going to do our best to be as fully prepared as we can. But there will be information for the public Absolutely. to take their own action. It makes it, it's a little bit ironic that most of the mitigation is to promote flooding. And uh, here we, now we put on our other hat and we want to stop flooding. No, it's not to promote flooding. It's yeah, to it pr promote is. wetlands which absorb flood waters. Yes. Can I, just on, as a related topic, I have been contacted by some residents that have flooded in the past and they're concerned about the impact of city properties on their flooding and staff is looking into it and we're the problem with waterways is that there are many overlapping jurisdictions and the city can't just unilaterally go out and say mm -hmm. dredge a trench or whatever mm -hmm. you know so we are working on that and i just want those residents to know that staff is looking into it we do have the updated flood uh, maps, don't we? Uh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, not an issue. And you're not going to be happy when you see them like that. As you got to get ready for some new insurance rates. Mm. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I think we covered that. Community development. Community development. Did, did you have anything to add that, under that topic? Public works and engineering. You, Pretty well whipped. You look pretty well whipped there. Good job. The only thing I would add, uh, Humboldt Street, we're just waiting for the final punch list to go through and do a cleanup. We have a few little items, and that project is completed. Um, same with emergency water. We're scheduling the final inspection um, for sometime next week. It'll depend on when. Um, 
the inspector can make it up here from Santa Rosa. She said either next week or the following week. But um, that project's about time for a barbecue and because uh, <laughs> it's, it's over. Um, and uh, I'm probably forgetting something. Dell but, Avenue. Well, Dell Avenue, we're, yeah. yeah. We're done with that one and moving on to uh, some sewer related projects and Main Street planning is coming up and um, preparing for the winter time. Mm -hmm. I think they'll have to redo their maps when they consider how much dirt's been moved from there to there when FEMA comes out and mm -hmm. surveys again. But I don't know, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. And I've only heard public, uh, positive comments on Humboldt. I mean, everyone has been really happy with how that turned out, um, including the business owners that border the alley. Okay, um, I think we can move on to council member and committee reports and talk. We meet Monday. LAFCO. Did not meet. MTA. MTA is meeting tomorrow in Point Arena and it's my birthday, I'm not going to go. <laughs> here, here. MSWA. MSWA met last week and... Um, oh, the, the only thing of note was... Um, when we were um, negotiating with um, solid waste uh, for a new new plan, one of the things that, that we were talking about was the organic um, mixed organics, and and we we added that into the contract, and we were kind of skirting around the issue of working with Cold Creek because we didn't want to be in a position of telling solid waste that they had to use cold creek but they did in fact make a contract with them one of the things that was going on at that time was um, sonoma county had a landfill and located on top of the landfill was a um, a composting facility and they had some issues with that it was leaking into the creek and it was ordered to shut down and you know there were things that were going on there so there was a concern that we really needed to lock in with Cold Creek to get the capacity before Sonoma County came down and grabbed it all and we wouldn't have anything left. Hmm. Well, as it turned out, that didn't happen. Uh, Sonoma County has found all kinds of other places to send their organic waste. So this whole emergency issue is not there and um, things are going along fairly well other than that. I thought you were going to want to bring it back up and we can do it again. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. EDFC? Uh, yes, EDFC met on August 13th, and um, the most interesting part of it was that we had a presentation from the Mendo Wool Project, and they have already received approval from Ukiah for a location for a uh, wool processing plant there and um, have their permit and they are seeking uh, funding through this local investing opportunity that I've been talking about for a while, so that um, we're really encouraging anybody who has extra money sitting in the bank getting basically zero percent return to invest in the uh, EDFC's pro uh, program, and that is going to be targeting this wool processing plant as one of the major um, you know, economic engines, I guess you'd call it, uh, it's going to benefit not only because it's in Ukiah, it'll benefit Ukiah, but all of the sheep growers and so forth and uh, ranchers <laughs> in our area should uh, should benefit. And keeping that money and those jobs local is great. Um, there's also uh, the biochar experiment that has already been taking place, has been very successful, and they're looking for entrepreneurs who would take it to a more commercial level. And so far we haven't... You know, that hasn't happened yet, but they're looking for that. And the third very interesting thing is that we're, um, EDFC is sort of embarking on an um, ent entrepreneur hub, and um, EDFC will be locating in a new place, which is um, at the Methodist Church in Ukiah, the adjoining building, not the church building itself, and is seeking um, any entrepreneurs who would like to look for a co-work space where there would be that kind of synergy with other other people and supports 
systems for, uh, for startup businesses in, in particular. So things are happening there. And I, I'm planning to have a, um, a gathering for potential investors to find out more about this local investing opportunity probably in late September or early October, and I'll keep you posted. All right. Good. League of California Cities. Did not meet. And water and wastewater. We had a report, I think, about our water meeting yesterday with uh, the one-stop shop. So. Um, Is it the state water? State water. Yeah, we talked about that a little. I'll fill you. It's a, a nice meeting. I, I think we uh, learned some of the proper buzzwords to use and some of the improper buzzwords not to use in order to <laughs> Don't to use this if you want your permit to get there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Revite Ed, I think there is something scheduled for that now, is that right? Mm -hmm. Jim, give me a second. Mm -hmm. And finance has not met ad hoc. Okay. Uh, we have an ad hoc meeting coming up. At Next, uh, Caltrans. on the 1st, I think. Next Tuesday, September 1st. Yeah, I, was, I had some notes. I don't think I can send them off yet today. And so that agenda will be published on Friday. Yeah. So uh, any council member reports or recommendations? Yes. Sure. Uh, I'm concerned with the water that is supposedly going to come about uh, one bay in the bridge down by the, the uh, library that is plugged that um, Fish and Game will not let us go in and clear it out to write a letter to them saying that uh, we really feel that it's a very important that we go in and clean it out so that the water will pass through without flooding that area. Is it vegetation filled or no, trash it's just filled? Rock. rock. Okay. I would really like to have the city write a letter to them saying that, you know, it's of great concern because everybody that is, you know, on that side is going to get flooded. Because it's not I think we can see that happens through the Public Works Department. Thank you. Yeah, about, I think last year or the year before, the, the council voted to approve the development of a care facility in Hale Creek. It was like a 24, 28-bit facility. And, um, Obviously, it hasn't happened. And just the other day, Elizabeth Santos, who was behind the development of it, she stopped me at the mailbox and she, she apologized. She, she wanted me to pass on the message to the council that she apologizes for not being able to make this thing happen. You know, the finances just weren't there. And she really feels bad about it. And she wanted me to say personally how bad she felt. Yeah. This is sort of a twofer. It's a council report and the good and welfare. Um, the word is getting out, and I'm sure all the council members know already about the grand opening uh, ceremony that's going to be for the new hospital. I think we're all very excited about that going forward, um, which I believe is September 13th. It's a Sunday. So I, I imagine it's going to be a really good turnout. And, you know, the city council was at the groundbreaking of the hospital. We've got the golden shovel in there in our trophy case. And so it's mm -hmm. going to be really exciting to, to see that finally open. Yes. They aren't actually so, starting to see patients there yet. But they don't move until October or it's, 15th. Yeah, is, is the, the public, but the ceremony is in September. Right. So I had the opportunity uh, last weekend, or I guess it was two weeks ago uh, now, to uh, select an honoree for the Leighton Hills Old Timers <laughs> baseball game, one of the coveted positions I have. And I selected Larry Stransky uh, to be the Old Timer of the Year this year. And, you know, that, which I really, uh, it was fun. I mean, it was fun to go up there with Larry, number one, but, um, but I learned a couple things about Larry that I, and I thought I knew everything there was to know about. <laughs> but uh, number one, and, and, and you may hear this again this weekend, but number one, you can always tell who's Larry's students were. 
because they all address him as Mr. Stransky. <laughs> and still, you know, and I think, uh, thinking back to it, I think I addressed him that way until we were cohorts here on the council. <laughs> I, I always address him that way too. So, um, but, but he has a tremendous network of friends and acquaintances out there that rival anybody that I have ever walked around town or between two communities with. Uh, so I mean, uh, he was it was a it was fun to go up there and it was uh, fun to see him uh, palling around with a bunch of old students and old friends up there. So that was a, a fun little And we won. Day. And we won in extra won. innings. Extra Nine innings. Nine to seven. Yeah. Great. I told them we were going to win. Yeah, we did. We did. We <laughs> both told them. It's a big deal. That. Yeah. So the old Thank you very much for the call, Bruce. It was very nice and and. Uh, it's interesting that uh, to talk to the young people that I can remember back in high school that were, you know. That are now old that timers. Are now, that are now old timers. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear that they lowered it to like 35, yeah, I think it is. So it's like, old -timer. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm officially an old timer as well. So yeah, it was fun. And I learned a lot about washing machines too that I didn't. Yeah, we did. We learned a heck of a lot about washing machines. <laughs> So anyway, um, any other good welfare? We have, uh, of course, now an, an additional item. We have uh, closed session item. Closed session item on anticipated litigation that we added to the agenda, and then we have uh, conference uh, on uh, our labor negotiations. Any. Votes that are taken in there, decisions that are made will be reported out into this room immediately subsequent to that meeting. So thank you for joining us tonight.